Kate Bordas, and Kate is a self-described adult onset naturalist. She's a transplant from coastal Maine, um, which she's going to be moving back to. Um, she's a trained master naturalist and nationally certified interpretive guide. She's had, had a lifelong distance love affair with nature. She's delightful living in the life of, she's delighted in living the life of a naturalist full time. She has frequent talks and walks in both Charlotte and Sarasota counties. Uh, specific focus on scrub habitat and endangered Florida scrub jay. Um, she's a, a naturalist and is committed in sharing with others the hidden wonders of the natural world. So she was a recent recipient of the Sarasota County Parks Volunteer of the Year Award. So she walks and talks for a number of organizations, including Audubon and the Native Plant Society. So uh, Kate, I'll let you take it away. Okay, this I'm going to say right now is the single most stressful part of the evening for me, transitioning to sharing my screen. So I'm going to do this. Bear with me. There we go. New slideshow from the beginning. And I'm going to take this down here and try to get rid of this puppy. Does anybody know how to get rid of that toolbar that's taking up far too much of my screen? It just goes away when you pull your cursor down on my computer. I'm not sure about yours, but on mine, that's how well, it is. It just wants to be part of my life forever. Okay, we're going to manage without it. So with everybody now, this is it. Insects part one. Well, actually, no. This is insects part two. So for those of you who did see part one, uh, this will be a recap. And for those of you who did not see part one, this is teeing up part two. So part one was about insects being awesome and amazing. And why is this not? Okay. Why are they so important? Well, they are miracles of evolution. This is uh, one of the most successful life cycles of all creatures where the adults and the young are not competing for resources. There are just a whole lot of them. It doesn't matter how you slice it and dice it. There are more insects than any other um, sets of creatures combined. They, as we as native plant people understand that native plants are the primary producers, everything else is a consumer, and insects are the primary consumers. That they concentrate the protein found in plants and they concentrate it to these yummy little snacks for, for birds and then so forth up the um, up the food web. They're also, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, oh, I'm going backwards. Sorry about that. They are the, also the great recyclers. So they're not just the, they're the alpha and omega of recycling. And they do this in large part. There are a lot of relationships in ecosystems where insects at different phases of their life partner with fungi. And those between the fungi and the insects, they rule the world. Uh, we make use of insects. Uh, for their products, silk. I don't think there are any native silk, any silkworms left in the wild. Uh, we use uh, for dye stuff, uh, for lac, the lac bug. They're, um, they are harvested in, in uh, Southeast Asia where they have plantations for the lac bug. But all that waxy substance that you have on everything, that's coming from insects. And of course they pollinate our crops, but but also just all the plants or most of the plants um, of gymnosperms, they start insect pollination. So they really do all the things that run the world. And the late great E.O. Wilson, and you can read this basically, if we were to go, that would be Yahoo for the world, go back to a rich state of equilibrium. If the insects were to vanish, the world would collapse into chaos in no time at all. 
so insects do run the world. And that was pretty much the part, a uh, part one. And then we come to the uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States in January 2021 said, well, but wait a second, uh, insects are in dramatic decline, no matter how you measure it. And there are multiple causes, so there's no any simple solution. Which brings us to the amazing insects, part two, insect decline. And oh, I'm not, I will, I'll take questions at the end, but if I really do lose somebody, by all means, jump in and ask a question. So in this program, we're going to, the four major parts, we're going to see how do you measure insect decline? What are the causes? Any reasons for hope? And then what can we do? And we, by that I mean as collectively, but also as individual. And here I lean heavily on Doug Tallamy's work. Well, how do you measure the decline? And it is very, very complicated. So what, when, how to measure. So I can look at this chart here that is issued in 2019, and it's just horrifying the amount of insect decline across these um, families, caddisflies, but 68% of caddisflies. But that is just a snapshot. All that is telling me is the total decline of 41% over 10 years. But what it doesn't do is take me back 10 years before that, 10 years before that. So we it's what it's called as the shifting baseline syndrome. So that we tend to take what we see as what is normal. Uh, it's, um, it's a very much a generational horizon. So we can have uh, a lot of uh, de de degradation and erosion, but nobody, it's like putting the frog in the boiling, in the water and heating it up. So we don't notice it. And the other problem is that when we do notice that there has been uh, that there's been a decline, we tend not to correct enough. We correct to just again what we think is normal. So shifting baseline means it's very hard to get the long the long view and the big picture. So with that in mind, we take a look at the studies that have been done. This is pretty uh, pathetic. I'll let the, I, I mean, I mean, I'll do the admissions. Here we go. Um, if you look at this map of the world, in all of Africa, there's been one study. All of South America, one study. Nothing up here. Two in China, two in Japan. This is one each in Australia. So there's not a lot of actual scientific study has gone into this. But where you see the big numbers right here, this is Germany. And that Germany has been out ahead on this. Oops, why some there we go. So this uh, Krefeld Society, sometimes spelled with a K, um, has been established in 1905. Consists of amateurs and some professionals, but really much a volunteer organization studied insect populations between 1989 and 2016. Malays trapped so the, the insects would fly in, they wouldn't have the good sense to turn around, and then they'd fly up, and then they'd be collected in the morning um, in these, or whatever, during the day. So where they collected every single insect, sorted them out, preserved most of them, uh, categorized them, weighed them, did all sorts of things. And what they found was between 1976 and 2012, this was the catch rate of milligrams a day, just catastrophic going from 473 to 13. You, you can see these numbers, huge drop off, uh, canopy faring a little better than open country. So they documented a 75% biomass loss. So just taking the weight, not the, the not counting the numbers, but just sheer grams per day, a 75% loss over 30 years. Well, you can imagine how well the um, 
the chemical companies took this news and that was this result was attacked because it could be the loss of just a few species. Uh, even though academics were involved, it was not a specifically academic study and the testing standards varied from year to year. And these were legitimate arguments, but what's, um, despite those arguments, uh, Martin Sorg, who was uh, the entomologist in that headed the campaign, did get an environmental award in 2020, and not the least of which because all of the Kreifeld's findings were confirmed by this man, Dr. Sebastian Seibold. Now he did a 10 year study, very specific sites. They went back to the sites every year at the same time exactly. They had the ability to identify every species of arthropods. So they um, were much more thorough. He had um, a, an academic department behind him. And his findings were that forest losses, um, I'll let somebody else in here. Over, so he just had a 10 year study, so it was shorter. And the, the forest losses over 10 years that uh, up to 40% of biomass, about 33% of species loss, and total population 17%. The grassland losses were much worse over 10 years. Biomass up to 66%, species loss is the same, but total population 80%. So in just those 10 years, there were staggering losses. And this kind of was the overlap of the last 10 years of, of the Kreifeld study. It's not just in Europe. Uh, our beloved monarchs were declared endangered in the summer of 2022. The, you know, as I'm sure you all know, we have two populations, a 97% decline since 1997. So this is well in our lifetimes over 20 years down to almost to extirpation. Nothing much better is happening in uh, Michoacan. Uh, the wintering sites are down. And you can see this is a 80% decline. And, and you can see this is a shifting baseline. So people here looking in this, in this decade are concerned about this decade, but not back here. So we have shifting baseline here. But this is really the telltale. All of us have experienced this. When was the last time on a road trip that you had to get out and wash the windshield? So we, however we look at it, however scientific or anecdotal we are, uh, the insect decline it has, is, has been quantified closely enough that we know insects are in big trouble. What is the cause of this precipitous decline? There's really one answer to that, and it's humans, but we've got a lot of tools in our toolkit. So these are the major problems like pollution introduced species, both insect and plant species, uh, the way we use land, the way we are just um, use willy-nilly poisons, and of course, climate change. Um, and climate change right now is not a big factor, but we're at the, that's gonna change. So light pollution. Uh, scientists have no idea why insects are attracted to light. They, their theories abound, but there's no real certain answer, but, but they do, and they just go up and fry by the millions. So when we have light pollution to the extent we have it, that is an invitation for kamikaze moths and other flying insects. And light pollution is getting worse. So I don't know if you can see this. This is a 2001, so this is a 20 year old projection, but you can just see the amount of light pollution here is um, an, an invitation for disaster for this cause alone. Invasive species, a, a careless translate, translocation. Uh, so the numbers of this is speaking just about exotic insects, but it's not just insects, but you can see how the numbers are jumping um, between 1975 and now. Um, and I'm gonna talk about one or two of those in a minute. 
So it's not always uh, invasive insects. Sometimes it could be a, a fungus where uh, this in the chestnut blight, it was a, an Asian fungus that the Asian chestnut had a resistance to that the American chestnut did not. And over a very short period, just billions of trees were lost. Um, a few, if anybody's read the overstory, a few uh, outside of the range of the blight do survive out west. Very much the same story with uh, Dutch elm disease. By the way, it's not because the elms were Dutch or the disease was Dutch. The disease was, um, oh, having a senior moment. The disease was, the cause of the disease was covered um, in in Holland by two by two women, and so that's why it's called Dutch elm disease. But here again, we have a beetle uh, working with an Ascomycete microfungi, and this is how um, beetle um, grubs get into and uh, eat uh, stressed trees. But in this case, they had the the elms worldwide had no resistance, and similar plant loss. So more recent, the emerald ash borer, first discovered in 2020, but probably around for more years than that. And it's a, a, an insect, the grub can do a lot of damage before the tree starts to appear stressed. So by the time you know you've got it, you're, it's too late to, to uh, reserve. So the emerald ash borer, all in green, is where is the range of the ash and all those little red dots are con uh, confirmed uh, emerald ash borer infestations. So there's not much healthy ash left. Now, this is just an example. We know about host plants and specialties that probably second only to the oak um, is a host for 239 inverts, 29 exclusive, 548 lichens, like an enthusiast for exclusives. So there you're looking at uh, 33 potential extirpations or extinctions and a lot of other um, species in trouble looking for an alternate host. We also have plant, um, plants come in, we, all, we know these. And so because they have no net, they don't, they are not host to any native insects they outcompete, so they don't have any predator. They then outcompete the native plants that are in balance with nature and getting eaten and all things being going well. So these outcompete the native plants, which starves out the native insects. So these aren't very good either. And I know there's one person who thinks that they're fine, but we'll leave that aside. Another thing is land use, uh, loss and fragmentation. And we're all guilty of it because we all live somewhere, um, suburban sprawl. So it's the loss, it's the fragmentation, the loss of biodiversity. And we know nature does not care for a monoculture, which is what we've done. I'm going to just, there we go. Um, so what happens when we do things like this is we slowly break down and fragment the landscape and at a certain point in and around here, dissipation, shrinking, attrition, that then becomes a shrink. There's really no bouncing back from that naturally. It has to be done and managed. Um, so insects are squeezed out and they're, they'll be hard pressed to find any suitable habitat or find their way back. I, there is a whole theory about it, the uh, island biogeography, so we'll leave that alone. So what about deforestation in terms of land use? So, so this between 2004, 2017, 106 million acres were lost, uh, both in the, at all the, for the boreal, the tropical, the temperate forests. So in the tropical rainforest, a lot of that loss was uh, intentional burning to make a way for beef grazing and palm oil production, neither of which is very good for the environment. And 
even when the, the forest is not totally destroyed, it's still, um, oh, am I getting ahead of myself? No, anyway, so it's in, it has increased. I was happy to see the election in Brazil, but about 50,000 acres a day. And for every acre destroyed, many more damaged and degraded. And it's estimated, although I'm not sure how they grabbed this number, but this is a number that I came across several times that species are going, because of this land use, species are going extinct. And most of them are insects. And of course, we don't know what we don't know about insects. There are all these insects out there that are going to go extinct before we know what they are and what they do in the ecosystem. And the first thing we might see is when parts of the ecosystem collapse in their absence. And some of these pictures, by the way, are here just because I like them. They don't really tell the story, but look, how could you not look at that picture? And I like this guy because he's got some attitude. He's saying, what are you doing in my rainforest? And we have to remember that if we're destroying rainforests and we're destroying the insects, the insects are the primary consumers. So what happens to the secondary consumers? or the secondary and tertiary consumers. So with the loss of those insects, there's it's, a, it's like a domino effect, so to speak. So what about the boreal and temperate forests? The boreal forests are in steep decline, uh, deforest, deforestation, climate change, and the thawing of the permafrost is accelerating. So, um, the boreal forest, which is home to um, so many tropical, neotropical uh, migrants and breeding birds, there's, there's a disconnect between the habitat and the available. So trees can't move, insects can move, but they need the trees to go with them. And if it's just, and then the birds get there and the insects aren't there. So it's this whole uh, temporal trophic mismatch that's aggravated by climate change. What about the temperate forests? Well, here's a really good question. What's the baseline? Well, it's a bit of a shifter. So these are the percentage of uh, woodland of land in England. So you can see over um, a thousand years, I quickly do my math, that this was denuded, deforested, and there's some uh, planting efforts so we do know that um, we've been losing woodlands and their support of insect life as, as a percentage. What about this country? Well, it's probably just as bad here because these were old growth forests and this is and this these have all been lost. There's really nothing here. And what we do have for growth is sort of scruffy second growth and plantations. I, I think I talked a few years ago about uh, the loss of old growth forests. So a plantation or scruffy second growth does not have the same environmental balance that an old growth forest does, not the least of which we don't have the super abundance of dead and decaying wood, um, the omega of the cycle. And for those forests and also it's deforestation and now climate change, things are moving. So in terms of the, the home, the habitat for many of our important uh, insects, we're just losing it. And the same thing that we saw uh, for shrinkage, the same that, that insects are just out of luck. And then we get to big ag. Now, Somewhere inside me is a story that wants to talk about soil because what we're doing to soil is another whole nightmare. Um, but we don't have room for it here. But all the microorganisms that we're destroying, the breakdown of um, the, the... So we'll, we'll save that for another day. So what does big agriculture do when it uses land? Well, it uses a lot of toxins to maximize production. So first we're gonna start with pesticides. So pretty clear, we all want inexpensive, abundant food. 
including the insects. So the insects come um, and they're making, making their way through some of the fresher growth. And what happens if this were um, the fresh growth of a native tree or an oak, so they would they would tackle this and then the the predators of those pests if we want to call them pests the primary consumers the secondary consumers are going to be other insects or birds so that will keep that population in control in the ecosystem well farming is not an ecosystem and so what farmers do they're not going to wait for the birds and the ladybugs they're going to just spray pesticides and then they're going to irrigate the pesticide. And pesticides, as we know, are water soluble and are getting into the water table. Now we've used pesticides, ancient uh, um, civilizations did, but they were expensive and only and very used very uh, minimally by the very wealthy. The Chinese also used. Um, it really wasn't until World War II that uh, the deep with the development of DDT, uh, other um, other um, compounds, that it really began in earnest. So IG Farben, who is later Bayer, was this is the company that developed nerve gas. So they know about nerve gases and DDT and methyl parathion, another nerve gas. These were developed and put into um, commercial domestic use by 1945. And so first time they're sprayed, you get a bumper crop, but then the next year, not so many, and you have to spray more and then just keep spraying and it's just spiraling down. And the, I'm sure I'm, telling the choir, this is because we have pesticide resistance developed. Now, not only are they killing the targeted pests, but the predators of the target press, excuse me, target pests are also uh, killed off and they have a slower life cycle. So now the pests that do survive and have a resistance, don't have any predators. So it just, it's sort of, it, it's cycling down. And where you spray is not where it stays. It, you know, it evaporates, but it gets into the groundwater. It's taken up by all sorts of other vegetation. Very little of it actually goes into the plant. One of the worst examples of this was uh, DDT um, and biomagnifying up the food web. Um, I had it somewhere in here. So the Rachel Carson sounded the alarm and in time uh, DDT was banned. Uh, the organophosphates were also banned. And what did we learn? It, I, my opinion, exactly nothing. We have 900 active ingredient chemicals are licensed and everything and these are uh, uh, trumpeted as being so much safer because we have to use so little of it. Well, of course, it's 7,000 times more potent than DDT. You don't have to use very much of it. So again, we're still back to nerve agents, neurotoxin ex ex attacking insect brains. It can be, it doesn't need to be sprayed. Now that can be applied to seeds, um, soil or seeds. And the idea that this is somehow safer is just nonsense. It's systemic within the plant. We'll talk about that, water soluble, and it persists in the environment. So you can, about 2%, if you're, if you're spraying it on, 2% gets absorbed by the crop. Maybe a half a percent loss of dust in the environment, but 90% is in the soil or in the water. So this is not exactly efficient and it's we're poisoning the entire environment, not just the crop. So it can persist and accumulate for up to a thousand days. By my calculation, that's almost three years. So you have an ever increasing body burden, if you will, or, or earth burden keeps growing every single year. And here are just some not so much fun facts. 
if they get a, if you you can um you were talking about putting it on as a seed coating is there somehow that's keeping it contained no it just all washes off seed fragments and dust very little of it goes up into the plant um, it goes into the waterways it's picked up by other plants and then uh, can just can um, little insects will eat it the birds will eat insects so you get the idea and it's systemic so this is good because it's like it's saving every part of the plant from being eaten by a pest insect except we do know that most crops are pollinated by bees and that um, the neonicotinoids will still be in the nectar and the pollen and although it's sublethal you got a dead bee if she doesn't know how to navigate so and I've got pesticides what about herbicides and fertilizers well these can't be as bad as pesticides right uh -huh. so let's just stick with one glyphosate roundup banned in Europe and uh, I did a little research and uh, about how much the wards are huge that people are getting, uh, landscapers or janitors or pe people who spent a lifetime dealing with this and now find themselves with horrible cancers. Uh, they're winning the lawsuits, but I'm more concerned for our purposes about the use of Roundup Ready and genetically modified organisms. Now, this is above my pay grade. But I'm going to try to explain that glyphosate targets two things, enzymes, the enzymes that make up the protein in plants, and then enzymes in bacteria. So by the miracle of modern science, the gene is edited into the crops at the seed level. So when, so instead of having two uh, targets for the plant to combine together, they resist the poison that is the glyphosate renders the crops immune. And so you can see these, these uh, Roundup Ready corn, soybeans, alfalfa, so these big crops. And so they can spray at will. Of course, a couple of things are happening. The, the, the insects that are still fertilizing uh, these plants are getting it in, into their system. And of course, we think of uh, the wildflowers that surround these crops, if, if they're lucky enough to have any, are also uptaking the poison. And so the fertilizer, we know that it affects uh, bac uh, bacteria, enzymes in the bacteria. And if you're a bee, you've got gut bacteria. So it's just every way it's cycling in through the pollinators. And it's shown up in honey. So we just know that this is doing terrible things for um, the honeybee navigations between the neonicotinoids and the glyphosate. Um, the bees are in big trouble. Now, I love this Dr. Earth, organic and natural. It's handcrafted blend. I just think that you want to eat this for dinner. It's just so wholesome and good and it's odor free. It's easy to apply. Well, these uh, nitrogen fertilizers are another set of problems, mostly because they don't stay where they're put. Particularly in Florida, the, the, um, the, the fertilizer ordinances uh, aren't enforced, they're not effective. And when, when it rains after an application, it doesn't soak them into the soil, it just soaks them right into the pond. And so we're poisoning our ponds. Um, I probably, so all those excess nutrients are taken by, up by algae, the algae dies, then uh, as it decomposes, takes the oxygen out of the water, which means there's less oxygen. We get fish killed. And then of course, all water flows to the sea. Um, where we see more algae show up with this nasty, icky mess. Uh, the algae uh, shades out the, uh, the seagrass, which doesn't grow, which is why we have our starving manatees. And of course, all those nutrients lead to red tide. So all in all, all the things we're doing in our garden are not just killing the insects, but they are just killing 
it, it, it's bad. So let's get back to fresh water again for a minute. Um, back to insects. So it should come as no surprise that these are the highest losses of insects are aquatic insects that spends uh, make probably their larval phase certainly dragonflies, mayflies, they spend their larval phase in the water. So if they are um, in this anorex, an, anorex of oxygen, low dissolved oxygen, uh, they're not going to thrive at the same level. So what about climate chaos? So it, I keep coming up with this 5%, but everybody has tolerances. Every, every creature has a range of tolerances. Some are really large, some are really narrow. And it may very well be that uh, responses uh, to climate change by enough species or that still the change is within the limit of tolerances, it's definitely not gonna get any better and very likely get worse. Just if we look at the temperature changes in the last few years, we know that Insects, they can't sweat. Uh, they, um, at a certain point, a certain temperature, they stop breathing altogether. And so how does temperature increase affect insects? Well, let's take a look at this. In some ways, it's really good if you're, if you're an insect because you have longer seasons of summer which increases the number of generations. The winters are not harsh, so you have the increased overwintering survival. Some, in some instances, diapause is suspended altogether, and there's an expansion of the geographic range. So let's see an example of how that works. So let's talk about these um, southern pine beetles, for example. Beetles in the natural ecosystem serve a wonderful purpose. They, they, they sense when a tree is stressed, the female plant uh, lays her eggs covered with fungus, and then that kind of breaks down the tree. The tree then dies, the, open up the canopy. It's really, really good for the whole ecosystem and beetles play a great role. With climate change, we don't have an occasional tree here or there. We have entire forests that are stressed, coming meeting hand in hand with populations of beetles that um, are no longer going into diapause and have many, many more generations. And so if we look at the pine beetle and the southern beetle, they're common to us. This is what it looks like. Of course, this isn't Florida. I couldn't find a picture. This is what it looks like when you have a, a totally stressed forest or ecosystem and the, and the pine beetles just come on through. So that's an upside if you're a pine beetle, um, climate change doesn't affect all insects equally. Most, so most it's about de, a, a desynchronization with the insects and the natural enemies or the insect and their host plant. And that's where we see a lot of, we see the same thing of the insect biomass in the Arctic is now uh, three weeks earlier than 40 years ago. So the birds come up. By the time they their chicks are hatched, the insect biomass is over, which is why we're not fledging chicks out of the Arctic. So the insects and plants and insects and birds are getting out of out of um, getting out of whack, I would say. So how does it work? So we talked about a temporal trophic mismatch. This is over here where some things are happening at the same time. Some things are happening too soon, uh, latitudinal. So this, this little guy here, this, um, this beetle is being forced down and the, the, this, its prey can go up and out of reach. Or if you change body size, which is a way to, when you have a very plastic, animal, you can now have a mismatch between um, a predator and prey. Uh, also, the change in uh, droughts, and we won't dwell on this, but this, uh, uh, precipitation and drought is making uh, habitats change. The incidence of extreme weather is going up. 
And so when things change this way, it's called the mad rule. You move, you ad adjust or die. Those, it's a very limited palette here. You can, you can do one of those two things. And I forget now which, um, where I got this stat statistic, but at least 30,000 climate driven rain shifts have been observed. I wish I could remember where I got that. And so what do you do? You can move. Okay, so here we have uh, this uh, in, uh, where are we? Sweden here, we got this, we've got a range. We've got these uh, butterflies are moving, they're expanding their range. So you say, well, the, the, uh, the monarch butterflies can do that too. They can, they can expand their uh, latitudinal range. They're, they're, they're where they are on the mountain, if it's getting hotter, they're gonna go up to, you know, a few more hundred feet, it'll be a little cooler. Well, that's not what's gonna happen because the arrangement with the Mexican government was that the villagers could harvest above the traditional range of the butterflies. So the OML forests above where they're now um, um, overwintering is barren. And they like they they need canopies. So the poor uh, monarch butterflies really have nowhere to go, and I don't know how they can adapt. But ad adaptation. So you move, you adaptation, and so this is the word ad adaptation. It depends. The real word is plasticity. So different species have different degrees of plasticity, different thresholds and tolerances. So those were the most threshold, the highest threshold and the largest tolerances. Like this little brown guy up here going to do really well. This guy is just going to plug away, and this guy is going uh, is going to be extirpated. Uh, I think we just discussed that. So so you, so if you don't adjust, then you're going to die, and that would be a damn shame because we don't know all these insects that are out there yet. Look at this praying mantis. This, by the way, uh, hangs around with orchids. But what about this moth? Can you look that moth in the eye and say, yeah, you're on your own, buddy. We gotta do something before the endangered become extinct. And there we have it. It's the death of a thousand cuts, what we do at home, what we do to have our food made, the changes in weather, storm intensity. We're committing ecocide on a biblical scale. This, I do recommend this book, David Goulson, Silent Earth. He is a bee entomologist and he just made this gen, more of a general book. So what can we do? Some, of, as I say, some of them are in here just because I really like that picture. So if you do get a pest, these are the, so these are the, this is the hippy dippy alternative lifestyle. What do you do if you get pests? Now these are the ones we all know, the milkweed beetle or milkweed bug that uh, the sap, they're sap and they're just competing with, with the milkweed caterpillars. So we can make up our own, um, I won't say pesticide, our own solution. A little bit of soap, a little bit of water. You spray them. They don't have uh, lungs like we do. They have spiracles along the side and the soapy film will just close that off and they will, uh, it just takes a minute or two. And so that is not destroying the plant. It's not destroying your beneficial or desired insects. Uh, and it can be targeted very narrowly to the insects that you are considering to be pests. Roundup, we've all done it. We're never doing it again. So we can make homemade or buy uh, vinegar-based uh, pest uh, herbicides, I'm sorry. And there you can do it at home. I know one person in our, uh, our chapter has, uh, whether she has concerns, the, the high salt content can't be good for everything, but you know, pick your poisons, ah, so to speak. Try to avoid, you know, eat local, eat organic. Every every time we do this, we're we're keeping pesticide out of the um, environment. Avoiding cultivated uh, genetically 
modified foods is harder because it's much it's it, because they're everywhere but again trying to eat organic will get around that plant native and if you can't plant native uh plant florida friendly to get um I'm, to, oh, I'm talking to native plant people but anyway that's okay but if some people can't quite get themselves fully native go in and find plants that will support your native uh, insects that not have to always be pollinators. Um, do a, to create a native plant, join the join the Xerxes Society, do all these things, uh, you know, make it go, you know, just wherever you are, you can put in native plants. Leave the leaves, this is really great for returning uh, nutrients, particularly here in Florida, to the nutrient poor soil. It's also habitat for our ground feeding birds who are going to go after the tritivores that are down there. And in northern climes, they're often um, pupae that are attached to some of these leaves and they're overwintering with their anti freeze on and turn out the lights. We can do this. This is good for insects. And um, it is also really good for our migrating birds who really get into trouble uh, with light pollution. And uh, learn more. So save bees from pesticides, and now we know herbicides. And here we are, learn more tips. You can do that by joining the Xerxes Society. They have wonderful publications, uh, lots of tips about what you can do. Um, I can come back to this later if I leave this up when we're asked answering questions, but I, I'm preaching to the choir here. You don't really need this. Vote for climate change. Um, kind of hard to do in Florida where their options are few, but, uh, and become educated. The fact that you're all attending this program tonight is a really great uh, start. These are all uh, books that I would recommend. And uh, if we want, I can make a list of these. Um, this is Silent Earth, The Insect Crisis. The hurricane, oh, this is where I got this, the uh, how many, um how many species have moved because this is this is actually a good upbeat book because the the plasticity of certain not just insects but of certain species to really change their shape and um it said so that's really kind of a, a, an upbeat book and of course do, do anything doug Tallamy asks of you and these are his um and he has, I don't know if it's a book, but now he's he's con consolidated these uh, into the, the Homegrown National Park, which is a movement and you can become a member and you can register and it just, you can take a little corner of your garden. Um, and if you go on YouTube, there's a, there's a Doug Tallamy YouTube, of what's the rush? And it makes a compelling case for getting on with it today. Oh, so there. I have nothing to say about this other than I really like it, and there was no other place to put this picture. So I have no idea what time it is because once my screen is up, I don't have a. But I, that's the end of my program, and if we have time, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Kate. You're right on time. It's almost eight o'clock. So. Yep. Good job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Except it's such bad news. So can you say something uplifting? <laughs> ah. The fact that uh, I guess we can all be, you know, we can all help. We can uh, buy organic, use, use no pesticides or use them very sparingly, mix your own, be very selective. Um, we can make the change, but it, it takes all of us. Oh yeah, Lucinda just said very depressing. Well, I didn't. I didn't promise a rose garden here. Um, I, you know, I do. Well, I think that we are the choir. That we are involved with um, native plants, and that we under we understand the process. But how did it get so bad so fast? Well, there's the, there's the the uh, the acceleration of the problem is. Here, why don't I put this back up? There we are. Yeah, so 
sorry to be Debbie Downer, but yeah, but but just you know, go back to um, Doug Tallamy and just do in your yard. And I'm I proselytize. You know, I, that's one of the things that people have been on walks with me know that I'm all about that second question I ask ask of my groups is who has a who has a garden in Florida. And you know, and then we'll make sure I talk about native plants and why they're important, even if it's on a birding trip. So I think all, each of us could, you know, just has that opportunity. Um, one of the things um, people say, "Oh, I live in an HOA, I can't do that." Well, the 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 authorizing statute for Florida Friendly says that no HOA can prevent a homeowner from having a Florida friendly garden. So, you know, just getting that message out, um, there's there's just a lot, a lot we can do. Well, I think people are hesitant of hearing the bad news. Obviously we don't like to hear bad news, but it is important because it, it brings people to the reality of what is happening, which so many people tend to turn their back at it and just go on with their everyday life. So I can read a couple of the chats real quick. Um, You've read a couple. Thank you so much. Very, very depressing, though, but that will change. Uh, lots of work ahead. Thank you, Kate. Great talk. Great talk and issues. Should These should bug people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so sad, but thank you for the education. Very important to educate people, even though it is depressing. Uh, Sean writes that there are more Ecoflora projects ahead. Uh, they're in the chat. Um, if you can make it. Um, I'm not sure where the next one is. Very nice. Thank you, Kate. Um, and like I said, one thing you mentioned about the HOAs is a lot of people say they're afraid of their HOAs, but um, we've encouraged people to get on their HOA and then they can really institute more change if they are part of the HOA themselves. And a lot of the HOAs are coming around and relaxing their um, requirements some um, and, and realizing the importance of what we're pushing here and have been for many years. So I think that's um, exactly I, right, Tom. With here, and it really is turning a battleship. So you have when you start, you gotta know you're in for a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um yeah. we we actually took the opportunity when we were revising the CCR and I was asked to help. And I just basically said, what you do is you, you cannot require people to put it forward a friendly or native, but you can encourage them and, and, and recommend it and make reference to and hand out the books. And, you know, there's a lot that can, but as you say, you've got to get the, the people move to Florida. They want to live at Augusta national golf course and lawns and so yeah it's just it's education 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 it's allison wrote, wrote a good one uh, my main motivation for buying organic food is for or to promote organic practices not so much for my personal health that's a very good point you know it's, exactly if we buy organic it, it translates to the agricultural industry using less pesticides so good good point allison um share this info with as many as you can we can make a difference yes we can um our local parks and government should be accepting these practices throughout the country um it's more if we demand it they'll start accepting it it's just you know the power is in the people and you know what our um it's in our pocketbook you know if we purchase um good product and don't purchase things um, it can make a difference Thanks so much for your very knowledgeable and passionate presentation. Very good. Well, okay then. So um, I've told a number of organizations that, you know, I might take a year off, but I'm going to come back and I'm not going to lose, you know, I'm I'm not going to lose touch with everybody. So maybe there's, I'm going to come do um, both parts one and two of this for the Peace River Butterfly Society. So and come back and do more for the library. So I really want to keep doing what I can to educate here in Florida as well as Maine. Well, it's across the board. It's geared, you geared a little to Florida, but it, it's really, you know, all across the country. So it's an important message. Yep. 
Well, if that is good, I will say, Erica, I'll see you Wednesday morning. And the rest of you, I just wish you all the best in your endeavors to proselytize this important, you know, just, so I, one of the things I say, but, you know, the Native Plant Society is not just, it's like little old ladies running around about native. I just like it's really sexy. It's about the environment. It's about the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's about, you know, so I try to punch it up. Well, anyway, I'm going to go have a cocktail now. I think I've earned it. <laughs> well, thank you, Kate. So, all right. See you all soon. Okay. Again, we have our field trip on uh, Saturday and the uh, fringe trees. There'll probably be a few still blooming. Um, if anybody's going, uh, bring in binoculars. There's, uh, been um, sightings of swallow-tailed kites up there, and they tend to congregate at Little Manti River Park. So we could see a few swallow-tailed kites up there, which would be interesting. Um, should be a nice day. Um, we're meeting at the, well, you can get the information. We're meeting on the south side of the park, past the entrance. Um, well, thank you all for coming. Um, Anybody have anything they want to chat about? It is a depressing to hear about the decline, but it is reality. And uh, we keep moving the bar down. It's like Kate said, it's, you know, we're kids born today. They don't see what we saw when we were born. Um, they only see what they're seeing now. And that's what they accept is the way it should be. Uh, and we know better. Our parents know better. Maybe they didn't know better. That's why we're in the position we're in, but we know better and uh, we can help make that change, I think. One bug at a time. Mom, is it possible to get the um, the book list in the chat box that was put up? Yeah, where is Alice? And, uh, um, I think it was recorded. Um, I think Kate's, unfortunately, I think Lucinda Kate's already left, so I don't know if I can. If I if I recall, they were all Doug Tallamy um, books. Okay. Um, right. And I actually did take a screenshot. If I can, I'll pull it up and put it in the chat box. Uh, uh, he has three books, and let's see if I can let's see if I can get that screenshot up. I know I did take a screenshot of it. Lucinda, one one of them was uh, Silent Earth, and that wasn't Doug Talmy. It was by Dave Golson. Uh, Golson, yeah, yeah. Go, Dave Golson. It's called Silent Earth. Here we go. Okay. Got that one. Let's see if I can bring that. Let's see if I can copy it. I think and there were two. Two. One was two about. The other one was Hurricane and Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid by Thor <laughs> Hansen. And a third one was The Insect Crisis by Oliver Millman. Okay, thank you. Things in Endangered and Extraordinary Insects. Oh, good. Maybe we could have Susie send it out to the newsletter list, please. Sure. Um, Allison, could you just text me your screenshot? Yeah, I'll try. And I'll, uh, <laughs> and I'll write them in the newsletter. Yeah, Thank you, Susie. Sure, no problem. Good idea. She did go through it pretty fast, but she had a lot of information to cover. So mm -hmm. it's nice to be able to go back and see some things. And copy. Oh. There. Got one to you, Susie. Let's see if I can get the other ones. It's uh, it's challenging. <laughs> I think there was another. I may not have gotten all of the books. Yeah, there were two. Well, you don't have to do it right this second. I'll I'll be working on the newsletter for the whole next week. So oh no no huge rush. Great, thank you. You're doing a great job on the newsletter, Susie. Really enjoy it. Well, thank you. Um, I have to give a lot of people some credit. Uh, Nancy West sends me and Leah sends me stuff. A lot of people send me the tidbits, and that make that helps a lot. And uh, anyway, thank you. I'm glad you enjoy it. I'm always up for uh, suggestions if anybody's got any. Okay. 
And that was the um, only screenshot I got. So, um, okay. We sent you other than the three Dentalamy books, which um, you could, I can look up and give you the titles of. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. It was a good meeting. I enjoyed it. Yes. Good. Good. Well, maybe we can ask uh, Kate too. She could list the books too. I'm sure I could uh, call her or she can, can email her and she can send a uh, more comprehensive list to you also, Susie. You're muted, Erica. Here, unmute. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to see her Wednesday so I can get the list of books from her. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, that's that's great. Thanks. Yeah. I keep saying it. I didn't know I was muted. Yeah. <laughs> I, need a lesson. I need a lesson in technology. <laughs> do, you, do you see the green box when you talk that comes around your picture? Say something. Well, I'm on my phone. I'm doing this on my phone, not my computer. So it's, I don't really get much of anything. It's I don't not, get a menu or anything. Well, it should still highlight you. And if you side swipe, you can get those things. The menu is on the side swipe, but anyway, no, no worries. Okay, I just side swiped. I didn't know it, you, that happened. Thank you. <laughs> what happens when you're out there in Mayaka, out in the middle of nowhere? I know I'm in the I, I'm out in the boonies and uh, <laughs> loving it. <laughs> How are the insects? <laughs> Actually, you know, it's speaking of insects, we haven't really had a lot out here. So, um, you that's know, right problem. around sunset, we get a few mosquitoes, but that's it. Because we've killed them all. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> Yeah, I remember I used to drive I what what is now I-75. It was uh 41 back then up to Gainesville to go to college um back in the 70s. And you know, my vehicle was just trashed. And now she's right. I I don't have anything. Yeah. Far. yeah. I mean, it I wasn't get... blood bugs, it was grasshoppers, it was all yeah. kinds of moths. Yeah, there weren't even very uh, many love bugs this year. Knock on wood. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, we haven't Great. had love bug real season yet. We haven't really started the actual season, mm. have we? I don't know. I always think of March, September. So yeah. Usually May. I thought it was always May. So usually in the April, May, somewhat. I remember. So. Okay. So there's still a horror but ahead. It is. <laughs> it is ironic that you know we all nobody yeah. likes mosquitoes nobody likes you know bugs and stuff to a point you know roaches and everything like that so human nature is kind of against bugs but mm -hmm. you know you realize the value that they do provide for not just the birds and everything but for our own our own survival yeah actually i miss my yard where all my native plants were because I would not, you couldn't believe the number of insects and the various types of insects you would see on those plants. I love that. Mm -hmm. Did you have a, a trick for spotting them or finding them? I, I just this week sort of made an effort to go out and on some of my plants, look for bugs in a friendly sort of fashion, not in fashion. Uh, yeah. And I did find some and I saw some that I'd never really noticed before. But um, but uh, that's new to me. So what was your technique, Erica, for going well, out and spotting bugs? I would just go out every day in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon, and I would just look on all my plants because I was always amazed at the variety of insects that you just don't see normally you know, when you're just walking or, mm -hmm. um, but you know, there, there would be on my tough, my tough buckthorn would have a different type of insects than my uh, woolly pyramid would have. And uh, um, uh, so many bees on my coffee. And uh, uh, I don't know, I just, I would just, just go out and uh, usually in the mornings when it was, you know, before the sun came out and got too hot. And I just kind of look around on my plants and, and that's when I'd notice all these 
various insects. And I felt so sorry for my neighbors who didn't have any plants in their yard, who, you know, weren't going to see anything. <laughs> spiders are my favorite. We have so many spiders and little tiny ones, you know, that are all over the plants, you know, and you just see them every all the time, you know, by looking at the plants, you know, but it kind of goes hand in hand with enjoying plants, you know, and yep. the bugs are there. Well, spiders are sort of some somewhat of a natural insect control, right? Because you know yeah, they yeah. put their webs on the plants and they catch little bugs. Sure, they do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and big bugs sometimes. <laughs> You know, even when I used to have a garden up north, I would never use pesticides on it because you always end up growing more than you can ever eat or give away anyway. So I never understood the reason for killing the insects on them because I, you know, I'd still get bumper crops of everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. All right, I will make a note to myself to ask Kate for the book list. And I'll right. get that to you. I'll Susie. shoot you a text to remind you. Thank you. I appreciate All right. that. All right. And I'm signing off. I got I have to go clean my new ceramic tile saw. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations. I'm very excited. Yeah, I was out sawing before the meeting. So anyway, oh I want it all to turn to concrete. Where did you <laughs> Uh, I'm just covering uh, pavers with tile. Okay. You know. Oh my gosh. She's yeah. going to have a art Are you house. Doing I'm working on it. Pardon? Tile? I didn't. Doing the tile work yourself? Well, I, I'm just cutting the tile. I mean, I'm just pasting them on the paver. It's nothing. It ain't nothing. But don't, it was kind of fun don't getting don't all minimize. that. Stuff. Don't minimize. That's good. <laughs> doing it I'm, I'm, well i didn't actually make the tiles i thought about making the tiles i didn't do that i, I bought these you. at an auction so <laughs> well i still like cool. to hear people you know getting their hands uh mm -hmm. you know whatever the project is and yeah. it, especially if you've never done anything like that before it's uh it's always it's always good for us to yeah you know, i well i have no sidewalk so i was trying to make some pathways and you know, I have all the pieces. It's time to put them together. Cool. I, I, uh, I had to clean out my garage because they're they're going to dig my garage floor up tomorrow to replace oh, the nice. sewer line. And I had at one uh, time thought that I was going to do mosaic work. And I collected a lot of broken pots. Everything I broke, I saved. Me and, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I had to move it all. And I was like, I don't want to move this twice. So I decided to make a border in my garden with all the broken pottery. Oh, cool. <laughs> you know, this bizarre looking. I, it hasn't it hasn't settled in yet to what it's going to be, but I just took all this broken pottery and went around and made an edge for one of my. That's fun, and it's there. If you decide you want a mosaic again, you just pull some out of the garden. Go pick some. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's cool. All right. Well, I'll see you guys. All right, yeah. Susie. Hi, Hi, Susie. everyone. Hi. Good morning. Yeah. Lucinda, if you want to send Hi, a Erica. send an email to um to the Serenoa site, then we can get you that list directly since you were the one that was asking about the books as soon as we get it. Rather than having to wait for the newsletter. Do you know the email address, Lucinda? I'm sure I've got it somewhere. I'll tell you what it is. It's S Repens. S is in Sam, R-E-P-E-N-S. One word, gmail.com. Thank you very much. Okay. Sure. Ryan, how are you doing up there in Vermont? You're muted. muted. <laughs> hey, Ryan, are you still there? There's Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Denny. He's hiding behind his beautiful photo there. <laughs> Doesn't look like the one put on Facebook. He must have gone, wandered off or fallen asleep. <laughs> After one of these meetings, I'm going to quiz everybody on one or two things they saw to see if they really were listening. <laughs> <laughs> when you don't see their face, you did. They usually show on. All the sites I looked at. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. It's a good program, though. 
Yeah, it was good. It's funny though, you know, I mean, intellectually, we know, you know, everything that she's saying and, and, and yet when there's a bug and it's in my turf, I want to kill it, <laughs> you know, and it's really mm -hmm. hard to overcome that, um, that attitude of feeling like, you know, you're willing to share your space with bugs, you know, for cute, it's okay. But, you know, if they're on my plant, I, you know, those Chinese aphids or whatever they're called, you know, I kill those things. Uh, you know, I listen to people talking about grasshoppers and the lovers, they just hate them. They want to kill them. And when they have all those little black babies that are, you know, everywhere, you know, they're like going crazy. Oh, yeah. Eat your whole garden. You're not going to have anything left. I just tell uh, people I don't have any in my yard. They don't seem to like the natives. You know, they, they like people's amaryllis and stuff like that. So fine. Yeah. You know? All right. I'll give that one. Thanks, Leah. <laughs> yeah, they, they like lilies. Anything in the uh, the, the lilies. Oh, hemenic... I haven't had seen them on my hemenicalis or yet. Or crinums. They seem to like. Oh. Definitely. Well, then I would kill them if they were eating my crinums. Because <laughs> yeah. mine's are native. <laughs> Mosquitoes, fire ants, and the lovers. That's, that's about it for me. Yeah. And even roaches, you know, when they're out in the garden, I don't really care. I mean, I figure something's eating them. The, the lizards eat them, stuff like that. Screech owls uh, eat them. Do they? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> What'd you do to your hand, Chris? That what? What'd you do to your hand? Look like you broke your finger. Oh, so. uh, well, last Tuesday I was swamping and and I anyway I broke my arm. You broke your arm? Oh, yeah, my elbow. Yeah. So you were swamping. Anyway, Would you turn the thing um, over? <laughs> uh, no, I was. Uh, um, one of the work days in March, we were finally able to get out to Walton Ranch to start clearing trails. And so I, it was a work day out there and I was um, backing up this um, cut oak branch. And I was watching, make sure it wasn't in the feet of the sawyer. And then I just fell, tripped and fell backwards and braced my arm with my, braced myself with my right arm and I felt a bunch of tears going on. And uh. so it, uh, yeah, they broke the ulna. And uh, finally get an MRI tomorrow. It's kind of been. Oh, a... Chris. <laughs> Are you going to cast? No, well, it's a uh, fiberglass splint mm -hmm. wrapped. And um, and then after the surgery, I have to have surgery. So after the surgery, they'll probably just do a splint again because I want to look, get to it and look at it. But I'm still well, that's working. That's good. Goodness. Are you right-handed? Yeah. I am left-handed. Oh, well, uh, I right! I, le I write left-hand. All sports, cut and saw, and everything's my right. So, oh, yeah. But I can still type in the office and things like that. And oh, what fun for you! Still wait on that doctor's note to get tomorrow. Hope I'll get it tomorrow. But anyway, <laughs> well, you should be able to get a little time off. <laughs> oh. I'm hoping to go back to work like a day or two after the surgery. But you know, you have to you have to do what the doctor says. Like you got to watch your balance and stuff like that. You know that you don't. Oh, do more. yeah, yeah. What is yeah. your surgery, Chris? I have no idea because I'm finally getting the MRI tomorrow. It was oh, supposed okay. to be Thursday, and the paperwork didn't go through, so they canceled it. Yeah. It was, it's been a mess. <laughs> Paperwork, so you couldn't get, oh man. And that's, a, and yeah, that's, a, that's a, a work accident, right? That's a workman's comp issue. Yeah, well, and I finally, they, my super, when I called my supervisor the next day afterwards, because I kept working, because um, I still had my left arm, so I kept working, <laughs> just put my right arm next to the <laughs> side. <laughs> And it was funny at the Thursdays at the Thursday staff meeting. I walk in there and at Twin Lakes, I'm I got this brace and everything on, and um, and they're what happened? What you and I said when it happened? They said we didn't even know it happened. I said yeah, that's right. I just didn't say anything and I kept working. Oh, Chris! <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but then I got back in the office that night, put ice on it, and then someone at the water plant said, "Oh, go put heat on it tonight." I was like. 
and I didn't and I didn't want to call mom until the next day to find out what was going on with it. So or anyway. the doctor. <laughs> Say what? Or the doctor. Yeah. So yeah. Call mom or the doctor. <laughs> oh, well, I, I called the doctor the next day whenever this thing inflamed up. Whenever I uh, put heat on it, that was whoops. That was a mistake. Oh. Mom was said, "No, you're supposed to do 24 hours ice." Ice. Yeah. Ice. That's in there. Well, you have swelling issues, you know, with with you know breaks like that. Yeah. Yeah. As far as workers' comp, you're supposed to report those immediately. You're not supposed to wait till the next day. Right. Well, I had the 24. Well, I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to use workman's comp. And then um, I had 24 hours to call my supervisor. So I, I finally did the next day and because I wasn't going to say anything about it. Um, but then I realized that night, when it, like 11, 30, 12, something was really, really, really wrong. So, um, well, yeah, it was pretty, yeah, the employ the, your employer who's pretty big in the uh, in the county down there. Is that's what they have workers comp for, and that's the insurance, so it doesn't go on you. Yeah, so, yeah. so I, I decided to go home, go with it just because they would, um, I didn't have to do any scheduled leave, and they would pay for my uh, if, I, if I had to take any time off, which I'm gonna try yeah. not to take too much. There's a lot of stuff to do right now. So, your um, bone yeah. is displaced, is that why you have to have surgery? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the and then they don't know about the soft tissue yet, so find out the oh, MRI Christ. tomorrow but yeah at least it was my right arm um, yeah. I can still write and type with my left and I could still go out there and pull things with my left arm so. <laughs> yeah and then you can fall over on your right arm and, and yeah. hurt it yeah <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not a good plan. Did you call your mother yet? You need to. <laughs> oh, I did. I called her the next day when I found There's out. There's something to be said to giving it, you know, 10 days or so before you, you know, start jumping back into things. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I hope to. I'll go do light duty in the office. And maybe <laughs> someone can drive me around. Drive me around to the properties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They'll find something yeah. for you to do. Oh yeah, there's plenty, plenty of work scopes and everything to do, contracts put together. So. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Well, just by the way, outside. Um, I, and by the way, I got a um, confirmation from Manti County Natural Resources that they would love to have uh, attended and set up a booth at the sale, but at Saranoa Days, but they uh, already booked for that day. Okay, all right. But next year, I just have to give them enough more time, more notice. Yeah, yeah, we need to get them earlier, so. Well, we can put you in the booth, Chris. You won't be all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, special. no, I'm going to be a plan expert. I'm planning on. Oh, yeah, all gonna... right. <laughs> yeah. I know, we'll need yeah. you because Ryan won't be here this year, so. Right, or. <laughs> Or maybe Damon. I don't know if Damon's going to show up or not. Well, Damon, I asked Damon. He's starting his new nonprofit. Um, yeah. So I asked him to kind of have a table for his uh, oyster river okay. ecology. Mm, so yeah. we'll try to get him out there to help with plants. But um, mm. we'll muddle through it. Yep. Yep, yep. <laughs> we'll get through it. So, well, I'm going to go get something to eat myself. Me too. Thanks, everybody. I hope you get better fast, Chris. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Allison. Good job with the Zoom. So. Yeah. Thank you, Allison. Yeah. Well, can't wait we to see take care, Ryan. Me. Take care. I think Ryan already left us, but. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was funny. He left his picture behind. <laughs> <laughs> what does he have to sign him off? <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Take care, Chris, and bye-bye. Take care. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you.